how do I raise a child without domestication? The answer is it's impossible. Mm. The reason why it's impossible is because the world has corrupted the way domestication is. The author of the four agreements is asking me to domesticate his grandchild. And he says, if you don't, someone else will, and you're not going to like it. I'm saying this as a father of a 17-year-old and the father of a 15-year-old young woman. They know that I love them. Mm. They know that I will love them regardless of what they do. But because I love them, I'm going to... Here's the secret of us parents. We parents have no idea what we're doing. Welcome to the Inspired Evolution. And it is such an incredible treat with us here today. We have Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. Welcome to the show, sir. How are you? I'm doing good, Amrita. Thank you so much for having me on your show. It's an honor. Thank you. Uh, it is an absolute gift and a pleasure to have you here. For those tuning in to Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. for the first time, he is a famous Mexican author of Toltec Spirituality and Self Mastery, New Shamanic Texts. It is such a pleasure to have you here. There is so much depth in this space. And I know the audience has such a passion for the type of work that you've put out in the world. Um, your book on Self Mastery is honestly, it's an incredible, incredible gift uh, to just dive into and just the way it unpacks things that limit us and also open us up is a, is a true gift. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for inviting me and Give me the opportunity to share my family's tradition with you and your audience. Thank you. I'd love to dive into a little bit more around that, actually. Let's just start there. So, you know, you were born in Mexico, but raised in California. Is that, have I got it correct? Can you tell us a little bit about your story? I was born in San, I was born in San Diego, California. And uh -huh. I'm one of those, uh, I, I, I lived both in Tijuana and San Diego, um, I'm one of those rare cases where I lived in San Diego, but I crossed the border into Tijuana, Mexico to go to school. And I would <laughs> cross the border back to San Diego, California, USA. And basically, that's how I did it for my uh, through uh, my elementary, middle school and part of high school. And then eventually for my senior year, I went to Bonilla Vista here in San Diego, California. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a border town boy or a young man <laughs> or... Elder man, whichever stage I'm in now. Yeah, there's been a lot of cross pollination in your system. And it's interesting because one of the big topics that I think if we were to hit the ground running in this conversation that I was really excited to dive into is you know, I read this in the four agreements, I read this in the self mastery as well, and this this real there's this concept of domestication, which I think is a really huge <laughs> Uh, conversation to wrap your head around, but actually quite simple to understand if you just open up your heart and go, oh, yep, this makes a lot of sense. And the minute you start di dialing into it, it's um, it can be a little bit overwhelming in terms of <laughs> how much we really are yeah. domesticated. Um, let's start there. Potentially, can you describe and define domestication for us in your Toltec awareness, please? Sure. Well, the main problem that the Four Agreements, my father's book and my book, The Mastery of Self, and most actually most of the book in our family, is the domestication, which is a system of reward and punishment by which we model the behavior of an individual, where if we live up to an expectation, we're worthy of our reward. Mm. And if we fall short of that expectation, we're worthy of the punishment. And since we are emotional beings who experience the full spectrum of our emotions, that reward, when we live up to an expectation, feels like acceptance, which feels like love. And mm. the punishment, we're not living up to the expectation, feels like rejection and the lack thereof of love. Is the way we've learned conditional love. I love you if you live up to this expectation. Some people prefer the concept conditioning. Like I remember once talking to a gentleman who says, we humans don't get domesticated. Only animals get domesticated. We humans get conditioned. Mm. Well, the thing is, is that it's the same exact same system. You mm. get a reward for living up to an expectation and you get punished if you don't. So it's basically the way we've learned to accept ourselves using someone's projection of who we're supposed to be 
in order to be worthy of acceptance, love. And from that point of view, we're living someone else's idea of who we're supposed to be. We're not living our own life. We're not living our own expectations or actually eventually we do to, uh, live on our expectations because we begin to self-domesticate. So that part mm. goes, goes in. So for us in our, in our tr tradition, that's what the domestication is, is the way we've learned how to love ourselves conditionally. I love myself if I live up to that expectation. So someone taught us how to do that. And eventually we became the ones who domesticate ourselves. <laughs> I think it's really interesting because I'm the father of an 18 month old at the moment and um, he's, you know, bright mm -hmm. as day, touch wood. And there are already, I can see myself looking at things and going, Hey, that's awesome. Keep doing that. Or, Hey, whoa, whoa, stop, <laughs> stop banging metal things mm -hmm. against the walls. You know? yeah. <laughs> and I can see just like, and, yeah, exactly, um, exactly, as, and yeah. as I've been but... stewing in your work and really dropping in, I'm like, Oh crap. Even without like, I obviously want him to be free, expressive, to do his thing, to be, you know, this vibrant being that he is, touch wood. Mm -hmm. And yet I can already see that like, oh, I'm already doing that thing, which is encouraging further domestication into his process. Yeah. I don't, it, like, is it avoidable? Is Or is domestication to some degree unavoidable, would you say? Well, first, congratulations on your baby, on your baby child. Um, that's Thank awesome you. news. Uh, it reminds me of what happened when my son was born. Uh, I have two mm -hmm. children, my, a son and a daughter. My son has autism. Um, mm -hmm. He is 17 years old. When he was born, you know, I've read what, all the books, what to expect when you're expecting, took the classes. I can make a good burrito out of them, you know, with the, the whole, the whole <laughs> how to Swaddling. take care of a child. I was able yeah. to, to learn how to do that, you know. Like, and he's the swaddling, yeah. I, I did such a good job that to, to, to this very day, he still swaddles himself. Like he, when he goes to sleep, he wraps himself pretty good. But anyways, oh, I thought you were going to say, I almost father, ate him because it looks like uh, such a good burrito. Son... <laughs> Sorry. I know. It's, good. it's such a good, like good, good source of protein and many other fibers. And minerals, like. uh, Please but anyways, continue. Um, <laughs> there you go. Uh, so basically it's, uh, my father said to me, congratulations. To me and my wife, obviously, mm -hmm. you made a very mm -hmm. beautiful cho uh, child. Now domesticate him. The author of the four agreements is asking me to domesticate his grandchild, which is a, a big mm -hmm. shock. That's the way my father teaches us. You know, if we will, we wanted to learn how to swim, he'll just throw us into the pool and say, swim. But dad, I can't swim. Miguel, swim. But dad, I can't. Miguel, your head's above water. You're swimming. I'm doggy paddling, but oh, there you go. That's how my dad teaches us. He sets up mm. a situation and tries to figure it out for ourselves. Sometimes he gives us little teasers like that. So this this one was a big one. He said, mm. domesticate your child. And he says, if you don't, someone else will, and you're not going to like it. You're not wow. going to like how someone else domesticates your child. Mm -hmm. So, of course... My, my first approach was, well, how do I raise a child without domestication? Kind of like you were saying. Mm -hmm. And after 17 years of being, I'm saying this as a father of a 17-year-old mm -hmm. who's about to turn 18 in six months. Mm -hmm. and, a, and, and the father of a 15-year-old young woman. And, and that situation, who's domesticating who? You know? um, <laughs> um, my answer to how do I raise a child without domestication? The answer is, it's impossible. The reason why it's impossible is because the world has corrupted the way domestication is. You see, domestication, like I was saying before, is a system of reward and punishment by which we model the behavior of, a, of an individual, where if we live up to expectation, we're worthy of that love. And if we don't, mm -hmm. we're worthy of the punishment. Mm -hmm. Life teaches us through action, reaction. In order for an object to move, there needs to be a force that moves that object. I use a little Nahuatl here. In order for the tonal to move, there needs to be a Nahuatl that moves it. Tonal mm. is Nahuatl for matter. My body is matter. Mm -hmm. Nahuatl has three definitions. Teach, spiritual teacher, spiritual guide, but the one that's most important to us is the energy that animates this body. I am not this right. body. I'm not this mind. I'm the force that animates it. I don't take it with me on my, mm. on my day of my last breath or my last heartbeat. Therefore, I am not this body. I'm the force that animates it. 
But of course, that triggers another one. For every action, there's a reaction of equal force. Mm -hmm. Life teaches us through the consequences of our own actions. All right. How to raise a child without domestication? And like I said before, it's impossible because life teaches us through action reaction. But in order to understand that, you have to be able to understand the difference of how I can uncorrupt domestication. Mm. Let me put it to you this way. Let's use our imagination. And actually, we don't have to use our imagination too much. Right now, you and I are using the electricity that illuminates our home, that gives power to the devices we're using to communicate from Melbourne, Australia to San Diego, California. The whole Pacific mm. Ocean is separating us at this very moment live, yet maybe just a couple of seconds of delay, but here we are, almost live. Insane. We're yeah, using incredible. electricity. Mm -hmm. Right. Beautiful, beautiful thing. You have to acknowledge that. Action, reaction. A consequence is not a punishment. A consequence is the result of an action. This expression, mm. is the juice worth the squeeze? Which to me simply means, mm -hmm. is the consequence worth the effort? Mm -hmm. Effort is using the energy that animates this body, that animates this mind to manifest something. Okay. At the end of the month, you and I are going to both get an electric bill. And of mm -hmm. course, internet bill, but let's just keep it with electricity. We're going to get yeah. an electric bill. Mm -hmm. If we pay the bill, the consequence for our actions is that we're going to get more electricity for another month. Mm -hmm. Right? Action, reaction. Neither good nor bad, nor right or wrong. A consequence is just a consequence. Neither good nor bad, nor right or wrong. Mm. If I don't pay the electric bill, the consequence is I won't get electricity. Neither mm -hmm. good nor bad, nor right or wrong. We might get a bad ding on our credit report, but it doesn't really matter. It's like this month, I didn't have enough money to pay for the electric bill because I had to make a choice. Electricity or food? Mm. Okay, I'll choose food. But if mm -hmm. I want to be able to afford both, I'll do the effort that allows me to afford both. And I say effort mm -hmm. in the sense of work, but sometimes all you have to do is just come up with an idea. Mm. Neither good nor bad nor right or wrong is what kind of consequence do I want? Life mm -hmm. has a motivator for us. And the motivator is what consequence do I want to experience? That's how mm -hmm. life teaches us. A mistake is just a consequence that didn't work out for us, but I still want to be able to achieve manifesting what I want to manifest. So I try again. It's just a mistake or not getting that, that goal is just a stepping stone towards arriving at where I want. It's just taught us, okay, this path didn't work. This exercise didn't work. This technique didn't work. Let's improve on it. Neither good nor bad, nor right or wrong, no judgment at all. What kind mm -hmm. of consequence do I want? And that's the choice we have at the end of the month to pay the bill. Domestication, the way we describe it, works a little differently. And it's like this. If you pay the electric bill at the end of the month, not only will you have electricity for another month, but you're someone responsible in society. You're someone that is able to pay for it. You're in good eyes in my eyes. You're somebody in this world. And you know what? Since I know you have enough, I'll lend you money. But you're in good standing in my eyes. You're someone productive. You are responsible. Mm. You are an adult. You are fill in the blank. Whatever mm. reward. Mm -hmm. But if you don't pay the electric bill, then you're a bum. You're mm. irresponsible. You clearly can't afford to pay a bill. There's no way I'm lending you money. Not only are you not and good standing in my eye, you're the sin of being poor. Mm. You're a bum. Mm. There's the punishment. The motivator there is punishing you, judging you for not living up to expectation of what it is to be able to afford an electric bill. Now, here's the thing. You reach that point, you have a choice between food and electric bill. But here's the thing. I don't want to look like a 
poor person in front of someone in the eyes. I don't want to look like a bum. I don't want to be irresponsible. Here's my credit card. I'll pay for both. Now, mm-hmm. not only can I not afford my food or electric bill, I have a debt that's increasing and it's continuously putting me into a hole because I'm pretending to be something I'm not for the sake of someone else's point of view. I don't want to, the judgment of being seen as irresponsible, a bum, mm. or poor, depending on that. There, the, the motivator for my actions is I don't want the rejection. So I will do the effort in order to be worth it. And I can say, like, even if you have a job, you're paying it because I definitely want to show and I have to get the right, not just any house. I have to get the right house. I have to get the mm. right car. I have to get, and all these kind of things. And also it goes, it's now mind you, there's nothing wrong with any of that, but the motivator is conditional love. I love you. Mm. If the motivator yeah. is love, the corruption mm. of it. So domestication mm. from that point of view is using the motivator of my love or your love or someone else's love to pretend to be something I am not for the sake of that point of view of the person who will be judgment, the judge and the victim Mm. imposing and subjugation. I subjugate my will. For example, hello, my name is Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. I don't Mm. take things personal. I don't make assumptions. I always do my best. I, uh, I, uh, What's the fourth agreement? Oh no, how can I call myself Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. if I don't know the four agreements? And there's the diatribe of judgment. Punish me, punishing myself <laughs> for not living up to this image of perfection that is Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. Mm. Who doesn't take things personal, doesn't make assumptions, always does his best, and he's impeccable with his own word. Hm, thank you very much. If I live mm. up to those four agreements that I am worthy of the name Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. I'm worthy of the name Toltec. I'm worthy mm. of all these things. But if I fall short mm. again, like forgetting the fifth agreement, be skeptical, but learn to listen. Oh no. And there's the diatribe again, punish myself. I don't even know what you're having in your show, man. I don't even know the movies. And there's the death. <laughs> it's kind of like the equivalent of saying the perfect version of myself. And mind you, to be perfect is to be 100% free of any flaw. To say that in order to be worthy of love, I have to weigh 160 pounds, be 27 <laughs> years old, and if I, you ever see my brother's hair, it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. If I live up to that image, I'm worthy of love. But if I look at myself in the mirror, that's just not the truth. I'm 47 mm. years old, I weigh 170 pounds, and this is the truth of my hair. But mm. because I don't live up to this image of myself that I deemed perfect, I'm going to castigate myself. You fat, you bald mm. fat, you all mm. bald fat. Mm. We feel when we look ourselves in the mirror and judge ourselves for not looking up to this image of beauty or success or manhood or, 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 or womanhood or all these things. That's what domestication is. Mm-hmm. The telltale signs that we use the four agreements as an instrument of domestication is judging ourselves for taking things personal, judging ourselves for making an assumption, judging ourselves for the rest of it. At that moment, we corrupt the four agreements and turn it into the four conditions of my personal freedom. I still call it the four agreements, but I don't realize that I'm just corrupted it Mm. and using it to go against me. Mm -hmm. And this is the way we corrupt so many of the beautiful traditions that humanity has created in order to embrace unconditional love. We're so used to domestication that will corrupt Don Miguel Ruiz in the Totec tradition, Deepak Chopra, Marianne Williamson, Jesus, Buddha, Siddhartha, Muhammad, psychology, psychiatry, Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm -hmm. Humanity has created all those beautiful traditions that allows us to embrace unconditional love, but we're so used to it that we'll corrupt all of them in the same way I just corrupted the four agreements into the four conditions. Mm-hmm. And if we understand that concept, we can see how we corrupted music. We corrupted fashion, our, our ethnicity, our historical background, our family, where we come from, our culture. I have to live up this image of masculinity mm-hmm. or femininity according to the traditions of not just my culture, of my neighborhood, of this family. And then I'm mm-hmm. trying to aspire to be this image 
that rejects who this person, this biological, physical person is. So if we understand this concept of the difference between the four agreements and the four conditions and how we corrupt knowledge, how we use beautiful expressions with music, we corrupt it. I listen to the music that makes me look cool, but I'll reject mm. anything that gets in the way. I don't want to be told that I'm a sellout. When I was growing up, the worst one I could ever get was, you're a poser, man. <laughs> and we judge ourselves. So all of a sudden, yeah. you know, we, this is the we corrupt yoga. You know, we corrupt mm. my yoga is better than your yoga. Well, I practice Kundalini and we all wear white. Well, I practice the mm. one that's trademarked. We, every move mm. is the same. At that moment, we corrupted something beautiful as yoga. And it's all its beautiful facets and expressions. And we corrupted it by saying, my yoga is better than your yoga. Thus creating a sense of hierarchy. I am better than. Because in order to be worthy of love, I have to be better than. So when we raise a child, you know, going mm -hmm. back to the question or comment about how do we raise a child without domestication? Well, first we have to clean that action reaction. How do you raise a child? Here's the thing about domestication. It tends to make us doubt our own capacity to say yes and no to things we want to say yes and no to. Mm -hmm. Thus, making us doubt ourselves. The best way to mm -hmm. domesticate someone is to make them doubt their own capacity to make a choice. <sighs> yeah. So learning how to trust yourself to make a choice and to respect yourself to experience the consequences of those choices Yes, I respect myself. Personal freedom is to be able to say yes and no with a complete freedom of life, to say yes to the things I want to say yes to and mm -hmm. no to the things I want to say no to. Like, and like Uncle Ben and Aunt May have told Peter Parker, with great power comes great responsibility, which mm -hmm. simply means, and it's beautiful that way, that as much as I respect myself to say yes and no to the things I want to say yes and no to, I respect myself to experience the consequences of those actions. So, for example, my wife, she's the disciplinarian of the family. You know, I guess I, sometimes I'm at tour and I can't help, so she is the luck. She gives my kids options. If you do this, this is the consequence. If you do that, this is the consequence. Which consequence do you want? Mm. Of course, we're still disciplinarians because sometimes, it's, you know, we get, they get into trouble and you have to teach them, you know, don't spit, don't break things, don't break this, don't hit that, don't, my son bites, so he, don't bite. Mm. And we have, we still find ourselves caught in that and the emotion of it, but we have to always say the difference between teaching them consequence and you know, action reaction, as opposed to conditional love is knowing that they know that I love them. Mm. They know that I will love them regardless of what they do. But because I love them, I'm going to let them experience the consequences of their own actions. They're not going to escape the consequences. They're going to experience it. Mm -hmm. And mind you, here's now, here's the secret of us parents who don't mm -hmm. tell people who don't have kids, and especially we don't tell our kids. We parents have no idea what we're doing. We're doing <laughs> the best with what we got. Yeah. <laughs> as soon as we get used to being the parent of a one-year-old, they turn two, making everything we knew about being a parent of a one-year-old one year irrelevant because yeah. the child we are raising has changed. Then they turn four, they turn eight. It almost feels like with every birthday, we have to throw out everything we knew about parenting because <laughs> the person we're raising has changed, which mm. means we parents have no idea what we're doing. We're doing the best with what we've got. And what that usually means is that when we have no idea what we're doing, we naturally go to what we've known, which is the way mm -hmm. our parents did it, or sometimes even do a 180 or 160 and just go in a totally different direction. But here's mm -hmm. the thing, even when we do that, we're still allowing the parents to teach us how to do it because we're re reacting to what they did not. We're the driven opposite. by the same energy. But we're yeah. still going to, uh, to that point. Yeah. So in, in essence, to be able to, to raise a child without domestication, we have to first come to terms and in grips to ourselves and how we did it. Mm. One of my favorite quotes is, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. That's from mm. Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, 
uh, Franklin, Franklin Roosevelt's uh, a wife, her first lady. So let me paraphrase that. No one can make me feel inferior without my consent. Let me paraphrase it one more time. No one can domesticate me without my consent. Mm -hmm. How do I give consent? By believing it, by agreeing mm -hmm. with it. An agreement is the action of saying yes to something. And I give mm -hmm. it power with my yes. So the best way to let go of my condition, domestication is one, becoming aware of it, mm -hmm. the mastery of awareness, and then forgiving myself for ever saying yes to it in the first place. A teacher in Sacramento once taught me this lesson. Forgiveness is the moment you no longer wish the past was any different. It is the moment you accept it and you let it go. So for me, that means this. It's the moment I realize I can't go back in the past to change a yes to a no or no to a yes because I can't go back in the past and express my will. My will only exists in its present moment. The past mm. only exists in my mind as a memory, just like the future only exists as my imagination. So it's the moment I realize it happened and I can't change it. Mm -hmm. So forgiveness is the moment you no longer wish the past was any different. It is the moment you come to terms, it happened. And you let it go. My brother, Jose Luis, Don Jose, has this beautiful image of a scorpion that sings itself over and over again, administering the emotional poison to itself that it meant for someone else mm. time and time again. And then it comes the moment where the scorpion decides to no longer sting itself, mm. to no longer administer that poison that it meant for someone else. We, Someone said to, to me, scorpions don't do that. No, but we humans do. Every time oh. we think of the past, we administer that poison to ourselves. We judge ourselves over and over and over again. To let go is the moment I no longer use the past to hurt myself in the present. Mm -hmm. I forgive myself for ever saying yes to it in the first place. I forgive myself for agreeing with all those beliefs that make me feel that I'm not worthy of love. That made me pretend to be something I am not for the sake of someone else's point of view. For example, hello, my name is Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. And I do take things personal. I do make assumptions. Sometimes I'm not impeccable with the word. Sometimes I'm not skeptical at all by hook, line, and sinker. And sometimes mm -hmm. I don't do my best. Just ask my wife. She is my witness. It is the moment where I stop pretending to be something I am not for the sake of someone else's point of view or someone else's judgment, especially my own. Because then I realized that, yes, someone domesticated me when I was young, but those judgments still are in my mind because I continue to say yes to them, mm -hmm. which means I use their words to go against me. Mm -hmm. I forgive myself for ever doing that. Miguel, can you forgive me? I've been using your words to go against me. When we reach this point, all of a sudden, we're able to teach our children how to live life without that domestication. But understand that someone else will domesticate them. If you don't, someone else will. Mm -hmm. So it is a moment where in order to teach a child how not to be domesticated with conditional love, that life becomes your teacher by allowing you to experience the consequences of your choices. That's when all of a sudden I'm no longer judging myself for the choices I make, but mm. completely owning the consequences of the choices I have made by allowing them to not just teach me, but show me a path that allows me to live the life I want to live. And I'm not the only member of this society. I'm one out of 0.7.5 billion, which means mm. I can't give what I do not have. If I have nothing but con domestication or conditioning in me, then I've got nothing but that to give. But if I begin to heal myself from heal my own wounds in that way, then I become the constant opportunity for harmony in my life with everyone I'm in relationship with. One of the big pieces that stood out for me in there around the the forgiveness piece as well, and I remember diving into your work, and this was... um. 
uh, painful is not the right word, but it was uh, uh, revealing is probably the right word um, for myself was this concept also, you know, you mentioned like, you know, when we're hard on ourselves, we're not hard on ourselves for the same thing once. It's like this repetitive story. And, you know, we, we do that based on, you know, as you so eloquently described the social programming and, you know, us like living up to those external valid, uh, external validations to try and be somebody that we're not to find that synthetic love. Let's call it that. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, the, the idea of justice, which was really huge when how cleansing um, when I heard that justice is paying for one thing once <laughs> and just how we treat ourselves when mm -hmm. we don't forgive ourselves and we keep going and we keep going and we keep just going. And it's like, itself. whoa, man, I keep, yeah. man. Yeah. Yeah. That was and, really something. And that's how into. we basically caused this trauma to ourselves. Mm. Yeah. That's how we create mm -hmm. trauma. And that's what conditional love does. It creates all this pain, all these wounds. And I've learned that we heal with our own permission. Mm -hmm. In the Toltec tradition, there's nothing to learn but to unlearn, like my brother Jose would say. For me, the most important things to unlearn are all the things that prevent me from healing. And sometimes our domesticated point of views are exactly those hurdles that prevent us from healing because mm -hmm. I have to be this image that I am not. But ultimately, um, the difference between conditional and unconditional love is this. Conditional love only sees what it wants to see. Unconditional love is the willingness to see the whole of who I am, to see the whole of the yin and yang. Mm. Uh, to accept my shadow self as much as the light self. Mm. Just both of them are me. This is who I am. So that to me is what unconditional love is, the willingness to see myself. And when I'm able to do that, I'm able, I'm able to see the people in my life for who they are. Instead of mm. the image that I project onto them, I get to listen and pay attention and witness who they really are. But in order for that to happen, I do that to myself, get mm. to know myself for who I am, what do I like, what I really don't like, what I do, what do I enjoy. And then I don't need an, an identity with a definition in order to get to know myself. All I need to do to know myself is to experience being me. Mm. Can you elaborate on that a little bit further? Because when I was reading into domestication, a big part of it was internal freedom. And then the, for me, the word that sort of kept coming back up was authenticity. And in that, I ran the risk of mm -hmm. idealizing like that there's a pure part of me that then due to social programming has been convoluted mm -hmm. from myself. And maybe that's accurate. I'm not sure. But the mm -hmm. question I really want to ask for myself oh, and the audience's behalf mm -hmm. is how do you, how do you get to know yourself when your layers and layers and layers of the onion packed on <laughs> like the de-layering process. And you've mentioned like you self-love. You, you, you hit it right in the head with your, yeah. mm, please. I, I was about to say, you hit it right in your head in, in the, in this, that's the expression that we have around here, by the way, uh, <laughs> you hit it on point. We, that you saw yourself with a ten, uh, the temptation or to idealize the authentic self. And that's what we attempt to do. That's, that's how we corrupt it. You know, how we corrupt the four agreements mm -hmm. into the four conditions. We grab mm -hmm. the concept of the authentic self has to be this way. And unbeknownst to us, that's how we begin to domesticate and even corrupt, uh, corrupt, corrupt that image of the authentic self, the idealization mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. I, that is a very much a very cool, a great way of, of of phrasing it because in your question you basically gave it, gave us the pitfall the the trap the mm. the the thing that usually takes us away from our authentic self i have to be mm. this image of authentic self with its definition with its explanation and i can't be can't be the authentic self until i live up to that image mm. You, you you see that just just with that we can see that we're so used to domestication that we're corrupt all of it, <laughs> even this image of the authentic self. We're so used yeah. to it, we just corrupted it just like that. Yeah, it's so easy.
because we're so mm -hmm. used to it. Mm -hmm. So that's when I go, okay, the authentic self is just another way to phrase because the need for each of us to understand each other is so important that we create a language mm -hmm. that allows us to understand. Every word we use in our vocabulary is an empty symbol whose definition is subject to agreement. There are terms that are innocent in the United States that are not so innocent in the United, King in the United Kingdom or in mm -hmm. Australia, because the, we may be speaking the same languages, but I'm well, well aware that there are some words that may not be so innocent there mm -hmm. and vice versa. You know, I've learned that one the hard way. <laughs> there are just some words. To be impeccable with the word is to be impeccable with your intent, because what gives a word its meaning is the intent that we give it, our yes, our agreement. Mm. That's what I told this to my father. And he says, that's exactly what I meant, Miguel. You're right. But since you changed the agreement, let me change it one more time. Be impeccable with yourself, because it is you who gives power to your word. Mm. So from that point of view, to be impeccable with the word and what is contrast to not being impeccable with the word is this. To not be impeccable with the word is to use my word to reinforce that conditioning. To be impeccable with the word is to use my word, not just to heal myself, but to love myself just the way it is, just to express my truth. Mm. In the question you had, it's perfect because you found yourself idealizing the authentic self. Right there, you, you laid all laid. Op laid open for us to see, or at least for me to see, that that is exactly where the trap is. The temptation mm. to domesticate ourselves yet again with a new image of what is supposed to be the acceptable. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Perfect. To be impeccable with the word is to be aware that I can do that. Mm. Now, for me, the authentic self is just the force that animates this body. And just like water, it shape shifts, mm. shaping itself to the container it gives. For example, the three women in my life, my mm -hmm. mom, my wife, my daughter. At one point, because here's the thing, The Mastery of Self is a book that I wrote as I was rock, talking about the five levels of attachment and how we begin to detach from our beliefs that domesticated us, a level five fanaticism where a belief subjugates me so much, it dictates who I'm supposed to be. My grandma used to uh, do this during my apprenticeship. She would ask me, do you control knowledge or does knowledge control you? She would always change that. You know, some cousins would get, do you drink the bottle or is the bottle drinking you? Who's drinking the bottle? Or who's mm. always the bottle drinking you? So, at level five, do you control knowledge or does knowledge control you? Fanaticism. Knowledge gives me the complete and total con controls of who I am. If I don't, in order to live up to this image, I have to live up to it perfectly. Thus, mm. domestication is so strong. At level four, internalization. The question is, the answer to the question is, knowledge gives me the rules by which I live my life. Whereas at level mm. five, it has complete and total control. At level four, it just gives me the rules. To go down from level five to level four is a moment of skepticism. To question it, is it truth? If it survives your scrutiny, then you say yes. If it doesn't survive your scrutiny, then you say no. You can say this is the work that we all do. This is the work that we talk about in the four agreements, to go from level four to level three, which is identity. At identity, mm. the answer to my grandmother's question is, knowledge and I are one. I think, <laughs> therefore, I am. I am my identity. Mm. It's to heal knowledge. It's to redeem knowledge, to no longer use knowledge as an instrument of my domestication, but an instrument that informs my, but, but, but I'm the one making the choice. Mm -hmm. To go from level three to level two, which is preference, is to take off a mask of who I'm supposed to be and get to know myself as the individual that can go in any direction in life. The answer to my grandma's question at level two is, knowledge gives me, informs me of my choices, but I'm the one making the choice. I'm aware mm -hmm. of my authentic self, which leads us to one, the authentic self. Regardless of what I think, regardless of what I know, 
I'm aware that I'm alive. So at level three to level two, this is where the mastery of self comes in. It's the moment where I take off the mask and I get to know mm-hmm. myself, not through the identity with a definition that has been mm-hmm. projected onto me and I adapt it or internalize throughout my life. But it's the moment where I begin to let go of it and get to know myself as the individual that I am, mm-hmm. which is formless. <laughs> this individual, just like we were talking about before, the thing about we parents, we have no idea what we're doing because the person we're we're parenting keeps changing. Well, guess what? I keep changing. I'm still changing with every day. I'm adapting and changing with who I am supposed to be and what I am. So from that point of view, letting go of that mask allows me to be present. So when someone projects it, like my, my, my wife, my mom and my daughter, all three of them project the mask of who I'm supposed to be according to their point of view. So to completely let go of that is know that my authentic self is going to be different to my relationship with my wife, with my mother, and with my daughter, because the way I react to them and interact with them is unique to the relationship I have with them. But I'm always the constant. So from that point of view, the authentic self is just a word a name, an identity that describes that which is shapeless, which is the energy that animates this body. So from that point of view, it's like where the mastery of self comes in. And it's the moment where I take off the mask, I'm to get to know myself to simply being the experience of me, that I don't need an identity with a definition in order to get to know myself, mm-hmm. which means I don't even need to use the word authentic self in order to explain myself is just a word <laughs> and all yeah. of a sudden you realize i don't need words to explain myself because even as i put one mask yeah i'm much more than that i'm complex an example of that is my relationship with my mom my wife and my daughter my mm. mom sees me as miguelito mm. my wife sees me as miguel and my daughter sees me as dad mm. i'm the constant with all of them so my mom is going to bring out an element of me that my wife and my daughter don't see my daughter is going to spring on an element of me that my wife and my mom doesn't see. Mm-hmm. My wife is going to see me totally different than my mom and my daughter. Mm-hmm. I'm the constant. But what makes me different with them is the nature of the relationship. I'm the constant in every relationship that I am in. And I only control to the tips of my fingers. I don't control who they are. Mm-hmm. But every single person will see me as unique as they see me. So from that point of view, I don't need to give the definition of son, husband, father, Mm. because the relationship I have with them is that unique, that my relationship with my mom is that of I'm a son. Mm -hmm, But I don't mm -hmm. need to domesticate myself with that mask. Mm. My wife will see me as a husband, but I don't have to domesticate myself with that mask. And same Mm. with father, with So from that point of view, every relationship will bring out a different element of me, but I'm always my authentic self. I'm always this individual Mm -hmm. that's engaging. So from Mm -hmm. that point of view, the temptation to idealize it, like the nature of the question is, the authentic self has to be like this. Mm. But the thing is, as soon as we put that, it only encapsulates and describes but a portion of it. Because the living being that I am, it's much, much more. Mm. I am a shapeshifter in the Mm -hmm. sense that I constantly engage an individual that's constantly changing. My wife, if you understand the concept of a parent, that Mm -hmm. we're learning how to be a parent because the child we're educating and raising is changing. And we know that because they're physically changing with every year. They're Mm -hmm. physically changing. They're mentally maturing. We can see those changes, but it's difficult to see those changes in my wife because like Einstein described that in the theory of relativity, <laughs> we're both growing up at the same rate. So sometimes yeah. we can't see the changes. But mm-hmm. my relationship with my wife is different and unique because she's changing as well. She's mm-hmm. not 28. She's not 30. She's not 40. And I'll stop right there. <laughs> and then my mom is the same yeah. thing. But she now I look at her and she's 71. And I'm like, wow, you've, that, that woman I used to know when I was a kid is no longer here. 
and she's trying mm-hmm. to figure out how to still be the mother with authority but now she's acting more like my daughter because mm. now she's at, she needs my permission to do things and i'm like when did that happen <laughs> <laughs> so we're now adapting and changing so here's the thing yeah. if we can understand that the people we're in relationship with are constantly changing which means that we're constantly adapting we can either mm. still hold on to who they're supposed to be and still relate to what person we knew or be willing to release that and see the person that's in front it's not about understanding men and women it's about understanding the individual that's in front of you and that can Mm. only happen once i'm able to understand that i've also changed Mm. i'm also evolved i've also grown i've also Mm. experienced life and life has impacted me that's why i change that's why my wife changed that's why my mom changed that's my daughter changed we're constantly changing so to say the authentic self is supposed to be this image, mm. that's a temptation to corrupt the four agreements into the four conditions and do the same thing to that. But it's just the willingness to step back and to experience who I am at this very moment in time, getting to know me all over again. Mm. And this time without the need to identify myself with a definition, with an identity and definition, but simply know this is who I am today. And this is what I enjoy. And this is what I don't enjoy. This is how I mm. feel. And this is how I don't feel. And there it goes. I'm, the authentic self is just a symbol to express the living being that is me. Mm. Yeah. I take a lot from that, especially the the consistent conceptualizing that the mind does for who I am, especially when you're describing your relationship with your mother, your wife, your daughter, and there's these concepts that can be so sticky. (laughs) And again, it's Mm -hmm. a domestication in effect. And Mm -hmm. as you're, as you're saying, saying it's, um, there's just this animate life force that is me that's present and it's just in, in an engagement. And can I just be present to it and not have to engage with the conceptualized, um, yeah, concept of myself, which is, really epic. I wanted to also cover in today's conversation, I'm conscious of how much time we have left, is um, this other idea of, well, taking this further, because in your book, which I really enjoyed, is we start talking about domestication and all the, almost the parasitical thinking, which we've sort of been discussing to quite length in terms of where we get trapped, and then also the allies, where the supportive thinking lives, um, and then how to really, you know, and we've danced a little bit around this conversation around self-love and, you know, the, the conditional love. And I think for those tuning into the Inspired Evolution, you know, they can feel into, the, the audience has that level of depth to be able to tune into that. The, the conversation then in the book goes to the point of goal setting, which I thought was a very grounded place to come home to, which I loved. One of the places that caught me off guard, though, is um, I have to put my hand up and vulnerably acknowledge that I um, I stopped setting goals and I kept setting intentions because, well, I wasn't mm-hmm. sure why. Goals started feeling a bit too 3D, a bit too clunky. And mm-hmm. the way I would describe it was if I set an intention, I keep myself open to what the universe wants to provide along that current, along that frequency, along that energy that you know is coming in, whereas my goal can be so 3D blinker limited. Mm-hmm. And then upon reading the goal setting in the self mastery, yeah, it started to unpick some things for me, which was like, uh, maybe you've set some goals and, you know, potentially there's some fear in there, which is why the intentions feel purer because you don't have the same stories around intentions that you do around goals. goals because yeah. yeah. Can you unpack that a little bit further? Cause we set no, goals and then, yeah, yeah. No, your question is set it up beautifully because you, you, st- you started to describe it, you know, it basically, we have a relationship with certain terms that triggers us and Mm. goals is one of those things that we use to domesticate ourselves. What is our motivator to achieve something? You can almost say that we've used goals to domesticate ourselves. As soon as I reached this goal, I'm worthy of love. For example, uh, when I was writing it, I was, I I, I was just preparing myself for my first marathon. And since then I've run Mm. six full marathons. I'm training for my seventh. Nice. Now, for me, running a marathon is fun. Mm. On that Sunday is the day. Let's see what I let's see what I can do. But mm. I really train for a marathon. The marathon is actually the three or four months prior. 
<laughs> getting <laughs> yourself ready, you know, preparing yourself. The way goal setting used to be, the way in, in, the, in the nature of the question you had is that, for example, here in the United States, most runners say, if I run a marathon, I can only call myself a runner if I qualify for the Boston Marathon. Because in order mm -hmm. to run Boston, you have to qualify with a certain time limit, a certain time ratio, depending on your age, three hours and 15 minutes, three hours, 20 minutes, depending on the, the group age you're in. You can get that tunnel vision that you described. So mm -hmm. hyper-focused where I have to get that goal. Otherwise, I can't call myself a runner. I'll just be a jogger. Mm. Now, in the running community, that actually exists. The way you can disrespect or diss uh, a fellow runner is by calling them a jogger. You're just <laughs> jogging. You're not a real runner. You're a jogger. You know, you're just a weekend warrior type of person. You're not for real. You're a poser. Anyways, uh, you know, we're back in high school, but they mm, still do it. It exists. Yeah, it exists. So you train, you train, you train. If you qualify for Boston, it's hard to even enjoy the goal because now that you mm. qualified, I can't call myself a runner unless I win Boston or at least I finish at a certain time. Otherwise, I'm just a jogger. And this is the, the nature of how people use goals. Mm. Like I have uh, the grass is always greener over there, mm -hmm. which is as soon as I achieve the goal, I'm worthy of, in this case, being called a runner. Mm. That's domestication all over it. We're using a goal as an instrument of domestication, just like I corrupted the four agreements and the, to the four conditions. I corrupted a goal. Conditional love. Conditional yep. love. I, yeah. What's the, my motivator? Conditional love. In this case, obsession mm. to acquire that goal. That's mm. what, you know, and, and, and that's how the tunnel vision comes. That tunnel vision become, is basically how obsession manifests itself how we experience it. Nothing else exists but this, mm -hmm. uh, the goal, qualifying for Boston. And I'm not sure internationally if there's any other race that's like that, maybe uh, the London or Berlin uh, Marathon. But in, this, in the United States, the, the Boston is, that's it. Okay. I run a marathon in five hours. That's my fest. My first <laughs> run marathon, I ran it in 6.20 miles. And man, I tell you, it was enjoyable. Mm. I enjoyed it very much because I'm like, when I first ran, the, when I, the first time I ran five miles, which is probably about eight kilometers, nine kilometers, something somewhere in between that, it was like, I proved myself that wrong. And I've asked the best question, what else can I do? Because I've proven myself that wrong. I did cross the five mile barrier. I did cross that eight, nine, nine kilometer barrier. Or more than that. Five miles actually is more than five kilometers. Sorry, it's not the, the kilometers. It's closer to eight or nine. Mm -hmm. There you go. I can judge myself for that. <laughs> because 10 kilometers is six miles. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's what actually what I was thinking. I can judge myself. For that as well. Mm. I should know this. I should know these conversions. But now I look like a fool. And there's the judgment. There's the punishment mm. for not living up to a standard, to a belief, to an idea. And now I corrupt it out as well. The thing about domestication and conditioning is that it doesn't allow you to enjoy what you've created. Unconditional love is this. If domestication is you're constantly chasing the carrot of illusion, unconditional love is that you grab the carrot and you eat it and realize this is point A. <laughs> and the goal is just the excuse to go in that direction. For me, it's this. I don't care if I qualify for Boston. I just simply enjoy running. Mm. And completing the marathon is just the excuse to run mm. for three or four months and yeah. do everything I can. And I've gotten, I've gotten better, of course. I've gotten better. Right now I am training for my 
next marathon. I do have the desire, the goal to do it in less than five miles. It'd be nice to see. Let me see that. Mm. Will my self-acceptance be dependent on me crossing the, the finish line in less than five hours? No. Mm. No, that's just the excuse. Mm. I enjoy doing it. Mm. On that day, when I do, I'm just going to enjoy it. Mm. Passion is doing something you love. And a goal is just an excuse to do something you love. As opposed to obsession, trying to live up to a goal in order to be worthy of love. Well, what happens if I already accept myself and my love is not the motivator? My love is the feel that, that takes me. Mm. It's, I'm, I'm eating the carrot. So from mm. that point of view, it's all about healing my relationship with the word. In this case, healing my relationship with the word goal. Is the redemption of that part of me that domesticates myself with certain things. So from that point of view, I can recreate or reimagine or reshape my relationship with that term or the concept of a goal by mm -hmm. understanding the difference between an obsession, which is creates that funnel vision. Mm -hmm. And passion, which opens my whole mind, my whole perception. And as I'm running, I'm just enjoying everything around me. You know, there's that thing when I run around mile three or four, where everything goes silence. And the only thing that exists yeah. is my breath, the road, and the environment that surrounds me. So Something beautiful. that is really hard to see when you're completely obsessed in tunnel vision with that goal. Hmm. You're completely present. So mm -hmm. for me, that's, that's, that's it. You know, we can change, give it different names to the way you, you did. Mm. Or I can just simply clean it. Mm. Kind of like consequence. Some people hear the word consequence and associate it with punishment. Mm. But if you clean it, then consequence is just a result of an action. Mm -hmm. What kind of results do I want to experience? Mm. And that's where the mastery of self comes in. And it's that sense like, what is the reason why I do certain things I do? Because I enjoy doing them. Yeah. I, and that's the thing. It's like, I have a friend who's qualified for Boston. Well, it's more of an acquaintance. He's a friend of my friend. Mm. And he's so bored with marathon because he is like three minutes, four minutes shy of crossing uh, and qualifying for Boston. And my other friend also qualified. It's like, it's like that. But for him, he's just trying. There's a difference between my friend, Brian, who I talk about in the book, who achieved it. He got it. But he just loves running. He just enjoys it. Versus mm. his other friend, this other person, that I can't call myself a runner unless I qualify for Boston. Mm. And there's the difference. Yeah. And in, in Brian's case, I don't care if you call me a runner or a jogger. I don't care. I just want to run. Mm. Versus, no, I have to qualify for, for Boston. Otherwise, I'm not even. Uh, mm -hmm. and, there's, yeah. and in essence, translate that to a musician, an author, mm. oh, everywhere. or anything, fill in the blank. And all of a sudden you realize what has been my motivator, a doctor, a lawyer, an activist, an artist, soccer player, a fo football player. Rugby player, cricket player, um, teacher, and all of a sudden you realize, man, I've been doing these things because I, I thought that's the only way to love myself. Would I still be doing it if I love myself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. The big discernment in there for me is, and thank you so much because it here it, this realization has healed so much for me around goal setting it because yeah the the goal being driven by even being super driven by synthetic conditional forces for love <laughs> to like hey even my own it's like when i do that then i'll be worthy of my own acceptance i'll be worthy of my own love or and should i hit it should i not hit it versus just dropping all of that to going hey i really enjoy this activity and it brings me so much joy and life force and vitality and animation 
And instead of potentially having an accountability buddy and a friend, I can mm-hmm. set an accountability buddy in my goal and let's just see where it takes me. Like, yeah, hey, I'm just exactly. going to run this marathon like five months from now and, you know, it'll hold me accountable every day this week to do, you know, yeah. a few runs to sort of get there. Um, yeah. And it'll just keep cultivating the love for what I do within my system. And I think that's exactly. really epic. Yeah. Thank yeah. you and so much. And we can translate that, that in, in, in a corporate world, you know, there's something called incentives, you know, in, in pop culture, success, whatever. Incentives are just something that people go, okay, this here's a reward if you live up to the expectation in, 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 the, in our business, in our corporate world. Taking that personally is the moment we realize, well, I'm nobody without that incentive. I have to have that incentive. And all of a sudden you realize the motivator why you do things is not the passion, but trying to live up to this incentive that we somehow took personally. Mm-hmm. But if you take a step back, there was nothing wrong with those incentives. Success money and all that kind of thing. There's nothing wrong. It's just that somewhere along the line, someone told us that you're nobody without those things. And we believe mm. them. But if we clean it up, that's just an incentive that, that I need or not don't need. I don't need to be popular. I don't need to be successful. I don't need to have that. But it's just the natural consequence of doing something I love. So I'll just keep doing what I love. <laughs> Don't make her release. Thank you so much. Really, 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 really thank you so much for this incredible conversation. I um there's a very special part uh in my heart that's open to this Toltec path of being the artist of your own life and just the creative wisdom that flows through that. And I think today's conversation around just yeah, the social programming that sort of in, like you know crunches in on us and just coming back home to clean like you kept saying just cleaning all that up and just allowing you know yourself to emerge and even not building a story around that self that's emerging just hey just acceptance and just allowing what is to be and I've come through is just such a gift I know the audience is going to get so much from this I I could thank you for today's conversation but I know it's a lifetime's worth of work that you <laughs> And in your case, even your father and your grandmother yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, work going into it. So just thank you for so no, much okay. for everyone just, you know, to be able to receive this download and this transmission from you today. Thank you so no, much. I mean, thank really. you so much for everything. And I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Mm. It's an absolute gift. Inspired Evolution Tribe audience, this show is what it is. Thanks to you tuning in and being so inspired to evolve. As your brother walking by your side, stay inspired to evolve. Keep evolving, y'all. So much love. Hey guys, if you enjoyed this video, give it a like, leave us a comment. And if you want to stay in tune for the new episodes launching every Monday, hit subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. Stay inspired to evolve.